This is Lewis Howard Latimer, the most hated inventor in the history of science and technology. What's his crime? Okay, wait for this one. His crime is not inventing the light bulb. That's right, his crime is that he didn't actually invent the light bulb. Here, let this guy and his friends tell you about it. Howard Latimer had nothing at all to do with inventing or improving the electric light bulb. You get the point. There are endless videos and articles debunking the claim that an African-American named Lewis Howard Latimer ever invented the light bulb. Only when you go looking, it's almost impossible to find where it was ever claimed that Latimer invented the bulb. Well, on YouTube, the closest you'll get to the claim Latimer invented the light bulb is this video with barely 50,000 views from the Black Excellence and Abundance channel titled the black man who invented the light bulb. Great channel, by the way. If you actually watch the video, the narrator goes on to clarify that Latimer didn't actually invent the light bulb, but that he did improve it significantly. So, you keep searching past one obvious clickbait video and still likely will not find anybody claiming Latimer invented the light bulb. I couldn't. Now, sure, somebody must have spread some fake news a while ago about Mr. Latimer and his achievements, but it must have been so long ago that, okay, fine, I'm lying. There was that one time the president of the United States of America said this. A black man invented the light bulb, not a white guy named Edison. But then again, Bo Jiden also said this. Well, we're going to win and we're going to help. We have plans to build a railroad from the Pacific all the way across the Indian Ocean. And this. More than half the women in my cabinet, more than, more than half the people in my cabinet, more than half the women in, the, in my administration are women. Somebody please wheel this guy back in and get President Orange Soda back out here. Look at my African-American over here. Look at him. Are you the greatest? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. We all know who really invented the light bulb, don't we? Thomas Edison? Actually, no. Like, no. No. Seriously, like. No! Thomas Edison did not invent the light bulb. He was only late to the party by about 40 years. Various versions of the light bulb were around well before Edison. They just weren't efficient enough to market. But a year before Edison filed for his patent for the light bulb, Englishman Joseph Wilson Swan had created the modern light bulb. So when Swan heard about Edison getting accolades and more importantly money for a copycat version of his light bulb, he sued. And get this, he won. Edison lost the case on home soil, a US court ruling that Joseph Swan had got the light bulb patent first. What most people don't know is that Edison was more a businessman than an actual inventor. True to form, after his legal defeat, Edison simply offered Swan a partnership in his business and Swan took the offer all the way to the bank. So where are all the videos angrily debunking the claim that Edison invented the light bulb? Mm-hmm, didn't think so. No, we'll reserve all the debunking bile and hate for blacks who get too uppity, like Lewis Howard Latimer, who dared to be so gifted that Edison just had to have him on his team rather than working for his competitors at Westinghouse and Maxim. Forget all you've heard about this guy not really being worth squat. No, he didn't invent the light bulb, but unless you're Warren de la Rue who gave the world the first incandescent light bulb way back in 1840, you can't lay claim to that accolade either. No, not Edison and not even Swan. So again, Latimer didn't invent the light bulb. But come here a minute, let me tell you a secret. His story and contribution to the world is just as big. Big claim, I know. But on this channel, we can back up what we say. Every claim I make about Latimer in this video is backed up by links in the description to reputable and unbiased sources. No smarty make smarty pants, not the NAACP. I mean sources like the UK's Institution for Engineering and Technology and, oh, I don't know, the US Patents Office. All I need from you now is to click the like button to help us get Latimer's real story out there as much as possible. We can also be friends just by you hitting the subscribe button. 
And if you really want to help us here at Trail Black get the word out about real black contributions to history, you can join and become a channel member. Check out our page on membership and the perks we guarantee our members. A special shout out for this video goes out to High Sage of the Troll Black Council, producer and member Black Rampage 2, for helping us tell Lewis Latimer's story properly. Bottoms up, bro. This one's for you. Right, let's get into the man, the legend, the myth, Lewis Howard Latimer. And we can start here. Norfolk, Virginia, where Lewis Latimer's father, George Latimer, fled a slaver named James Gray for the city of Boston, Massachusetts. On the 8th of October 1842, William R. Carpenter, a friend and former employee of James Gray, spotted Latimer Sr. and immediately radioed back to Gray in Virginia, hoping to cash in on the reward for the runaway slave, $25 if he was caught in Virginia and a whopping 50 bucks if he was caught outside Virginia. On October 18, James Gray arrived in Boston and claimed George Latimer had stolen from him. On the word of such an upstanding moral citizen of the US of A, Latimer Sr. was thrown in jail. But George had already made some friends in Boston. Up to 300 black men, not to count the women, called straight up bull on George's larceny charge and rounded on the courthouse to demand his release. And wouldn't you know it, God-fearing white folks soon joined the fight too. One of those was George Latimer's lawyer, Samuel Edmund Sewell. And on October 30, 1842, Sewell darn near started a riot at a town hall meeting he called on behalf of George Latimer. Boston folk were gathered by Sewell to quote, provide additional safeguards for the protection of those claimed as fugitives from other states or as slaves. In November 1842, with Latimer still in jail and his case being fought in court and in the streets, literally, Bostonians started the magazine, The Latimer Journal, hoping to get more of the public on their side. It worked. The good people of Boston by and large started to turn out more and more for Latimer's cause. Because of the George Latimer case, Boston became, quote, without a doubt, the most potentially violent city in America. But NPCs are gonna NPC. See, some types bemoaned all the fuss, saying that the Latimer Journal had greatly excited and alarmed the credulous, vexed the irritable, inflamed the passionate, and exasperated those whose sympathies ran beyond their judgments. But thank God for the black troublemakers, the Boston 300, and their rabble rousing white brothers who tore up the whole city of Boston. Because of them, on November the 18th, 1842, $400 was raised and paid in full by a black minister to free George Latimer. And George Latimer with the good people of Boston all lived happily ever after. Sorry, forgot. Now I've got to tell you about Latimer Jr. See that? There's a whole movie already in George Latimer alone and we ain't even got to the main event yet. His son. Instead, Hollywood out here making Mission Impossible 20. Anywho, Latimer Sr. and his missus, Rebecca Latimer, who escaped with him in 1842, went on to have four children, of which the youngest was Lewis Howard Latimer. And thus, a genius was born. Genius, you say? Yes, genius. First off, at the age of 18, Lewis Latimer taught himself mechanical drawing at a patent's drafting office, where he was supposed to be an office errand boy. Latimer wrote in his diaries that he would literally look over the shoulder of the firm's unamused draftsman just to see how he used his T-squares, compasses and rulers. Then he'd go home and with the tools he purchased himself, he'd reproduce what he saw from his own mind and memory. All this from a man who two years prior had lied about his age so he could fight in the American Civil War at the age of 16 a man whose father had disappeared when he was only 10. Nobody knows exactly what happened to Latimer Sr. Some have speculated that with America facing civil war over slavery and on the back of the infamous Dred Scott decision, which ruled that escaped slaves could be re-enslaved if recaptured, George Latimer fled home. But that doesn't fit with the image of a man 
who had been so brave early on in his life and had been happily married for nearly two decades. To just up and run? Nah, not buying it. We just don't know. Maybe he was recaptured. I see 12 years a slave based on a true story. In any case, by 1872, in his early 20s, Lewis Latimer was hired to replace the chief patent draftsman at Crosby, Hosted and Gould Limited. Only six years prior, Lewis and his mother had been in and out of work cleaning houses for Tom, Dick and Harry, not limited. But by 1876, still in his 20s, Lewis Latimer had gotten so good at drafting and drawing up new technological concepts thrown his way by would-be inventors that Alexander Graham Bell called on your boy's services in patenting his new invention, the telephone. The frigging telephone. At this junction, I know what you're thinking. Wrong. Crosby, Halstead and Gould, where Latimer worked, later became Crosby and Gregory Limited. Why? Well, Gould died for one, and Halstead had been bought out by Gregory of said fame. Only Crosby remained and he soon retired, leaving newcomer Gregory the effective sole owner of the patents business. Problem was Gregory didn't much like Latimer. I wonder why. Owing to this change in management, Latimer was once again broke and unemployed. But guess what? Latimer was always the main character in his own story. He always found a way up and out. In 1879, he moved to Connecticut for work. At first, he hanged wallpapers and did odd jobs as a handyman like his father had done before him. But soon, his real talent landed him a job drafting patents for the Fullens B machine shop in Connecticut. And even here, greatness stalked Latimer like one of these guys on cake. At Follensby, he ran into Hiram Maxim, a man who would go on to invent the notorious Maxim gun, this old thing. Without it, European powers could not have defeated the formidable West African kingdoms of Sokoto, Dahomey and Ibadan, as well as the empire of the Zulus in Southern Africa. Anyway, before Hiram Maxim made his breakthrough with his gun, he was in the electric lighting business and was on the lookout for brilliant technical minds to help him beat and out innovate Edison in the voltage wars. In 1879, he ran into Latimer at the Fullensby shop and remarked that he had yet to encounter a colored person who drafted so admirably. Get out of here with that load of what other colored man do you see in Connecticut in 18 what's it what's it drafting patents, Mr. Maxim? Hey, hey, go on. See, what Maxim meant to say was he had yet to encounter a person, period, who drafted so admirably. There, fixed. Shifty, low boiling son of a. Whatever, suffice to say that Hiram Maxim hired Latimer on the spot. Lewis's stroke of luck came just in time for the light bulb revolution taking place across America. In 1880, New York was lighting up. Competition was hotting up between hotels, banks, everyone to keep up with the Joneses and replace their gas lamps with this new technology, the light bulb. Hiram Maxim's United States Electric Lighting Company was fighting Edison and Swan's Electric Light Company fiercely for these lucrative contracts. In 1880, Maxim landed a big one, lighting the Mercantile Safe Deposit Company offices in New York. And who did Maxim call on to supervise the entire project? None other than your boy, Latimer. In little over a year, Lewis Latimer went from hanging wallpapers for a living to expert mechanical draftsman and boss of all things to do with the newest, most important technological development of the age, the light bulb. Hiram Maxim tasked, tasked, ta no, tasked. No matter where you go, the blackness gon' follow you! Hiram Maxim tasked Lewis Latimer with supervising not just the lighting of his New York projects, but in 1881, when Canada's railway stations were lighting up, Maxim sent none other than Latimer to go to Montreal and oversee the entire works. Once there, Latimer quickly won over the white workers under him due to not just his general likability, but the fact that he had been teaching himself French in his spare hours and had become proficient in the language. Yes, this guy taught himself how to draft technological drawings of any kind, 
became a patent drafter for one of the world's foremost companies dealing in the revolutionary technology of the age to the point where white folk in North America, not two decades on from the official abolition of slavery, had to take instructions from him and him alone. And in his spare time, he just decided to teach himself French. And oh yeah, I forgot to mention German too. Just because he could. And people want a mount of a man's... <sighs> Seriously, we need a Latimer movie. And it has to be done properly. Not like what Netflix just did to good times. Because this story is actually worth it. See, in 1881, the Savoy Theatre in London became the first public building to be lit entirely by electric light. Who got the contract? Edison. Maxim was sweating. So in 1882, his US Electric Lighting Company merged with England's Western Electric to take on Edison and Swan in the UK. Who did Maxim send to England to oversee the installation of the company's new light bulb plant? Our main character, Lewis Howard Latimer. But in England, Latimer faced problems. Are we allowed to say it or are we being too woke for GB News? According to Rayvon Fouché in his book Black Inventors in the Age of Segregation, quote, He had a difficult time gaining the trust of British workers who regularly complained that Latimer was incompetent. Historian Aaron Klein suggests that the Victorian Britishers who ruled millions of black people in their worldwide empire were not used to taking orders from a black man. Close quote. Well, it really didn't matter to Latimer because nine months later he had birthed the first light bulb plant of its type in the UK and duly dispatched himself back to America. And now is when Latimer made enemies with people whose granddaddies hadn't even been farted out yet. In 1881, his inventive genius shone through. Latimer received a patent for a new type of light bulb after making a groundbreaking discovery in the light bulb arms race. He discovered that by somehow encasing them in a thin overlay of cardboard, Edison's bamboo based carbon filament light bulbs lasted far longer than their usual time span of a few hours. This Oh so minor invention is said by Lemosin MIT to have made bulb lighting quote practical and affordable for the masses. But Latimer didn't stop there. During the same period he throws Hiram Maxim's company which was rapidly falling behind Edison's companies a revolutionizing lifeline. Don't believe me? Well listen to this. Quote Latimer patented an improvement in incandescent lamps in September 1881. The technique produced a cleaner attachment from the filament to the wire connections. The bottom of the filament was widened and into this enlarged section was cut a rectangular slit. A copper platinum contact would be placed through this slit and bent down around the remainder of the filament. The system dispensed with all forms of clamps nuts, screws or pins and similar accessories. Latimer had now produced two fundamental innovations that the United States Electric Lighting Company introduced into the production of its lamps, making its lamps a viable competitor to those produced by the Edison companies. Latimer was in no small way responsible for the limited success the company experienced. Close quote. Rayvon Fouché, Black Inventors in the Age of Segregation, 2003, page 97. But if you think this is all of Latimer's contribution to the light bulb, then do me a favor, please. Get out of here. On January 17, 1882, Latimer received a patent for the process of manufacturing carbons an improved method for the production of light bulb filaments, a process which was purchased by Maxim's United States Electric Lighting Company and greatly streamlined the industry's manufacturing processes. Now take all this together and you are compelled, I mean compelled by the evidence to conclude like Rutgers University's Dr. Baylor Singer that quote, Contrary to popular belief, invention generally proceeds with small steps rather than flashes of dramatic insight. Some of these steps become part of later successful artifacts. Latimer's among them, bearing testimony to the inventive activity associated with the light's development. All are important in the overall development of the artifact. 
Close quote. Elsewhere, Dr. Singer says this, quote, Unfortunately, only one person captures the attention of the public and is hailed as the inventor, no matter how much previous work he builds on, nor how much additional work must be done to make the invention sufficiently useful and economical for it to become widely acceptable. End quote. Basically, what Singer is admitting to there is that Latimer did as much for inventing the ancestor of the modern light bulb as Edison did. Funny that, because Edison pretty much agreed with this when he called on Latimer to be one of the founding fathers of something called Edison's Pioneers. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when the supposed father of the light bulb is having you in a club of quote unquote lighting pioneers, I think it's safe to say you did something pretty important. This was in 1918, but before then Edison had made the clever decision way back in 1884 to hire Latimer for his expertise on the light bulb. One of Latimer's roles working with Edison was to use his massive knowledge of the light bulb to find if anybody was infringing on any of Edison's patents. The complexity of this type of a role is difficult to overstate. Those who have counted them say that Edison's patents filled over three bound volumes. Suing someone for patent infringements typically involves poring over the tiniest technical differences, technological fine lines. Basically, if you're going to successfully sue people infringing on your patents for something that everyone and their mama was making copies of by the 1890s, you have to know your stuff. Boy did Latimer know his stuff, and Edison knew it. In fact, Latimer was crucial to a case in 1889 against his former employer, Hiram Maxim's United States Electric Lighting Company. Low, right? Well, ask Maxim, who did Latimer even nastier in 1882 after freezing him out of his job at United States Electric, just after Latimer had almost single-handedly kept Maxim's company afloat and also exactly at the same time Latimer needed the money the most. Why did Latimer need the money the most in 1882? His first child had just arrived and it was then that Maxim decided to freeze Latimer out. We don't know exactly why, but our guess here at Trill Black is that Latimer was becoming too successful too quickly for a jealous Hiram Maxim. See, Maxim was notorious for randomly suing his own employees whenever they made innovations without his permission or when they started to gain more notoriety for their inventions while working at Maxim's company. Latimer was later involved in a lawsuit against Maxim on this very issue. Whatever the case, unlike Maxim, Edison seemed to treat Latimer like an equal, a similarly exceptional man, not just exceptional for a black man. And that was good enough for Latimer. In fact, whatever else is false, Edison did not seem to be the type to shun a man due to the color of his skin. We know this because in 1918, Latimer made it into something called Edison's Pioneers, a select group of people who Edison saw as crucial to all the innovations that made the light bulb a successful technological revolution between 1880 and 1885. In fact, Hackaday.com says, quote, Latimer was bestowed this honor despite never working in Edison's laboratory itself. Most of the founding members of Edison's pioneers were people who had worked with Edison during those earlier years. Thus, Latimer's inclusion into this group was Edison acknowledging what Latimer did for the game independently and even while he was working for a hated rival. I mean, come on folks. If you're going to start talking trash about this man and start saying he didn't do this and he didn't do that, at least know your stuff. This guy clearly didn't. And like others, is only crudely capitalizing on the reactionary trend right now of denigrating black history in the name of fighting wokeism. If the race baiters really knew their stuff, they would tell you that Lewis Latimer was one of the granddaddies of that thing that's lighting up your room from the ceiling right now. In 1890, Lewis published Incandescent Electric Lighting, a practical description of all things to do with electrical lighting. This is reportedly the first treatise ever on electrical lighting. Let that sink in. 
The first textbook on electrical lighting was written by an African American man. So, did he invent the light bulb? Not exactly. But not exactly no either. Did he write the book on it? Yes sir, he did. So put some respect on that man's name. Put some respect on my name. One more thing. Perhaps Latimer's greatest achievement wasn't the invention of a modern toilet for trains, nor was it a light bulb that actually lasted for more than a few hours, nor inventing the mechanism that would be copied in the design of the modern air conditioner, but his undying love for his wife. A part-time poet, listen to what Latimer wrote for his black queen, shared years later with the world by his granddaughter, Dr. Winifred Latimer Norman. Let others boast of maidens fair, of eyes of blue and golden hair. My heart, like needles ever true, turns to the maid of ebon hue. I love her form of matchless grace, the dark brown beauty of her face. Her lips that speak of love's delight, her eyes that gleam as stars at night. O oh, marble Venus, let them rage. Who sets the fashions of the age? Each to his taste. But as for me, my Venus shall be ebony. Mary Wilson Latimer died in 1924. Her husband died four years later at the age of 80, in December 1928. All hail the true black father of the light bulb, Lewis Howard Latimer. From Cush to Compton, this is your boy, Trill Black. See you in the next one, no doubt.